Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see those of you who are able to join us in person today. And I just want to thank you guys for doing such a good job of following our request on on wearing masks and sitting in family units and all those things. You know, you've done a really good job with that, and you're to be commended. Um, I want to tell you a little story about a church not far away from San Antonio, where just not too many weeks ago, they had, um, any, they had a, their church service, and they had not mandated that everyone wear masks. And about half the people in the church did wear a mask, and they generally stayed <clears throat> seated away from each other. They tried the six-foot thing, although once they sat down, they felt like, oh, it's okay, we're a family. And I'm not sick. And the pastor even said, well, I'm not sick. <clears throat> and he gave in to the request from someone who said, can't we hug during the greeting? Fifty people from that church now have COVID, and some are not doing very well at all. In the interview with that pastor, he said if he could take that back, that slackness that he took, that complacency, and know that he did not contribute to 50 of his flock getting terribly ill, including his wife, he, uh, he would have definitely done that. So they're not, obviously not meeting in person right now, and our goal is to continue to be able to meet in person uh, as, as long as we can. But So just thank you for, for doing your part, because the more little things we do add up to th good things. So I appreciate that very definitely. You know, the community health indicators are not good in Comal County, in Guadalupe County, Bear County, Texas, pretty much south of the Mason-Dixon line. If you watch some newscasts, you'll see that they'll say, uh, one of them even said, the uh, most hilarious story I read, Florida, Texas, Arizona are hot spots for COVID. And they honestly believe it has something to do with the border of Mexico being so close. And then I looked at the map and I thought, that's a lot of water between Mexico and Florida. And somebody who's writing that has no idea how many miles there are from the Mexico border to Dallas Fort Worth area. That's several states in the rest of the country. So the reality is we just have a lot of virus around us and we need to do everything we can to, to keep people as healthy as we can. And, and the, the steps we're taking, I think, are making a difference. It doesn't mean that it's going to go down or go away. It means that it, it's not going to get as bad as it would have gotten. So we're going to just continue to be dutiful in that regard. But because of that, we have got know that this is going to be around for a long time. We're not going to come to a place anytime soon, I don't believe, when we're going to be able to say we're going to meet in as whatever number we want, and we're going to be able to embrace each other, and we're going to be able to have multiple meetings a week and all that kind of stuff. I don't see that happening anytime soon. So what we're going to have to do is say these are the circumstances we're in. We're not going to claim the circumstances aren't true. The science is clear on what causes transmission and uh, the reason churches show up so high on, on all the charts of, of risk is because of singing and because of the closeness of the people and how hard it is for close people not to trust one another and the belief that you can actually think that you know whether you have the virus or not. You'd be the first one who could tell. There are a lot of people that, that carry the virus and they just don't know it. doesn't mean that you can't transmit it to someone else. Because of all of that, we don't want you to lose connection with your brothers and sisters in Christ at Grace. So because we are in these circumstances, we're looking for all options that will allow us to stay connected. One of those options that we've used for the ladies' Bible study for a little while, and this last week we did a first test of doing the midweek Bible study using, it's called Zoom. And what it is, is it's like a conference call that allows you to see the other people and they can see you. So at least you get to make hand gestures using all fingers, waving at the same time to other people. It's nice to be able to wave to somebody. It's nice to be able to see them, see their eyes. I've started even zooming with my with my folk, with my my mom, because I want to be able to see her. You know, I want to be able to see what she's look, what she looks like when I tell her a joke, if she's rolling her eyes or not. So, she usually rolls her eyes because I don't tell very good jokes. But what we're going to do is we are going to continue the Zoom class in this fashion. So what that means is 10 o'clock on Wednesday mornings, the midweek Bible study is going to be a Zoom class. So uh, we'll send you another notice. If you'll click on that, that link, it will take you to it. Now, I know what somebody in this room is thinking and whispering. I don't like that program. It's technology. You got here using technology because none of you walked. 
right? You all came in cars that are more high tech than computers were 10 years ago because your car has probably five or more computers in it, on it, about it. So we will help you get connected using that if you will call the office. We'll get you set up. We'll make sure that you can get through it. It's really not complicated. It's so uncomplicated, my mother, who hates technology, was able to do it. So if she can do it, believe me, you can do it too. And we'll help you make that happen. So after the, this little test run we did of Zoom on, on Wednesday of last week, we went ahead and, and broadcast that out. That's what you saw. We learned some things. There's some things we need to do differently on our end, and we'll educate you about those. But I wanted, I, I wanted to see what Jim's impression was right after he finished the class, so I just had him do a, a brief video, and I want to show you that right now. Well, I want to show it to you. Can you switch the camera over? Well, we'll show you the video some other time. Speaking of technology challenges, um, well, we've had plenty of technology challenges here this morning. What I can tell you is generally uh, it is really nice for the instructor to be able to see the people who are, um, who are in the class. It's very helpful when they can see that. And I think that the people, well, I know the people who participated really enjoyed being a part of the class as well. So just look for that email, click on it, call if you have questions on how to get on Zoom. Um, you have the option of using your video or not, and we'll walk you through all those, all those details. You know, we give of our time, talent, and treasure in, in, every day, every week, right? So sometimes we're, we're doing volunteer effort, and we have people that volunteer here at Grace all the time. I mean, the garden out front, even though God is a great gardener, he, he didn't come pull those weeds. He sent angels to do that. The trimming of the trees was done by angels in the church. So we need to thank those folks who, who did that. It looks beautiful outside. But however you're giving to God's family, his, his kingdom, we thank you for that. And we're going to ask God to bless that. Whether it's your time, your talent, or your treasure, and however you're giving, whether it's online, check, you know, cash in the plate, whatever it is, uh, there are many ways we can give. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for our ability to return a small portion to him. Lord Jesus, we have offered you our time and the talent you've given us. We, we offer up to the kingdom. We ask that you multiply our physical efforts when we come out and work on the church building and when we go out and try to spread the gospel. We offer our time freely because we love you and we want to serve you. Likewise, Lord, every time we make a financial donation, we ask that you, you bless that gift that it will be used in a way that honors you according to the principles you've outlined for churches and for families. We ask, Lord, for you to bless each one who was able to give this week, who was able to make a donation to the kingdom, that we might continue your word both online and in person. Lord Jesus, we ask that you bless those who give, that they feel release from those gifts as they give them, that they understand that it's all yours to begin with. We're just being obedient and loving and kind and in returning a small portion to you. Lord, we ask that you bless each person who, who is in need right now, that they know that there are people who love them and care about them, that they know that there are ways throughout our community that people can receive assistance that they need. It may not be physically in, within the four walls of this church, but it is in the community. It is available. So help us, Lord, to help those who are in need most. This we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light. That overwhelms the darkness There is a kingdom that forever reigns There is freedom from the chains that 
back. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are the words of the Lord, and we can trust them. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Phil. Well, good morning, church. Isn't it great to be alive today? Yes. I sure am glad y'all are alive today. And I'm glad that we're able to gather and, and visit on the Word of God today. You know, the message today is, is a continuation of the message last week that I titled, In the Valley. 
Uh, and yes, we're covering this beautifully short 23rd Psalm, so popular, and it's taking me two weeks to go through it. So you might say, well, how come you can't go faster than that? And I'll tell you because God's word is worth every minute of it. See, there are three major parts to the 23rd Psalm. And as we take our time going through it, I mentioned these three major sections last week. The first one is David's exclamation. That is that the Lord is my shepherd. And you see that in Psalm 23, 1. And we know that the Lord, and I talked about that last week as his title is actually here, Yahweh, the God of Israel. So this is not any Lord. This is the Lord is my shepherd the very creator of everything from nothing. That's the one who's my shepherd. And sometimes it's good for us to remind ourselves who exactly it is we're following. It's that guy. The one who, who sent his son to die on the cross. That God, part of the Trinity, is the one we worship. And then, of course, the second section was David's expectation, and that is, I shall not be in want. That's in verses 1b through 3, basically. And we're going to have everything, not that we're going to have everything we desire, but that God's going to provide everything we have necessity of. How often do we, we think we need something, and, and suddenly you find out, well, you didn't really need that. Hopefully you find out before it gets delivered to your house. You know, you're watching late night TV and you see an ad and you think, oh, that, that's, that will make life so much more simple, so you've got to order one. Or if you're my, my dad, you order three. And then the next thing you know, they show up on the doorstep and you wonder, who ordered this? And how would anybody ever use this thing? Well, see, that's the difference between a desire and what you really need. God's not going to provide everything we want. And when you think about desire, but everything we would have want of when you think about necessity, that's the difference. And that's really where I stopped last week, because, you know, the, the culture would want us to, to, to really live our life in the desires of the world. And you can have all those desires in the world, and you're never going to be satisfied. But then we go on to the next part of the expectation. It's where we pick up today, and that is, I will fear no evil. That's, that's in verses 4 through 5. Well, do you know anybody like that nowadays? Anybody without fear? I mean, fear is everywhere. You have fear on the far one side, fear on the, on the other side. And when I say side, lots of you are thinking, yeah, the left and the right. And I'm thinking top and bottom too. Because it's all around. It doesn't matter what your perspective is. We have a lot of fear. But that's what we're supposed to believe if we believe the scripture is true. I will have no fear. And then David's exaltation continues on. That's, that's in verses 5 C through 6, and that's my cup overflows. And that's what we're going to be covering today is those two sections. So we, as we continue with this expectation and talk about this idea, you know, we know about the want. We've already covered that. We talk about this idea in verse 4. And we have to kind of set it up a little bit. The statement of, it's a statement of circumstance. See, 23, 4 says this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, well, that's really an awful phrase to use when you're in the middle of a pandemic, isn't it? I mean, what kind of marketing genius decided, oh yeah, I did that, decided I was going to talk about that. You're walking to the valley of the shadow of death. It's like, look over there, I see a virus, it's in the air. It's up there too. And you, you've got a virus, I can tell. Ugh. But we're more familiar with hazards we can see, right? I mean, because you can't see the virus with your naked eye. So that's how you can't know that you're sick with it, because it, it gets into your cells and, and it replicates inside your, actually your cells replicate and it gets replicated along with your cells, that's how it works. So you can't tell if you've got it until it's really too late. So you could have like five days worth of getting other people sick before you realize, oops, shouldn't have done that. I felt good as you're getting somebody else sick. But we're used to, we're used to watching for, for hazards. And when I worked in, in a hospice group and I was the chaplain, one of the things we were trained in was to look for trip hazards in a house, you know, because everybody's house has got trip hazards. And what hurts most people as they get older are falls. It's because we trip over things. We trip over the silliest things. So here I am. I like to walk when I preach, right? And everywhere I go, I've got trip hazards. I've got a monitor here. I've got music stand. I've got microphones. I've got books. I'm not sure what that is. And then I've got these cables over here, monitors, more, all this stuff. Everything is a trip hazard. Everywhere you go, there are holes in the floor. It's a good thing it's not Saturday. I'd have my high heels on. I'd go right into one of those things. 
Everywhere you go, you could trip over things. So as why is it then with all these trip hazards, I mean, when I come up here and speak, do you think I can see where my feet are? Absolutely not. I've got 2,800 vision, which means if you can see it 800 feet away, I've got to be 20 feet to see it. That's my vision. So when you get down past the edge of my glasses, I don't see. It's the black hole. I am flying in a black hole. I can't tell where my feet are. The carpet's the same color there. How am I going to tell where the edge of that is? Well, easy. When I break my face, that's where the edge was. But why is it that I still want to walk the chancel when I preach? Because to me, what I'm doing when I preach is I'm supposed to be connecting with you and connecting you with the cross, the Jesus of the cross. And I can do that more effectively if I can keep you engaged, and I can do that more effectively if I can look at you and point at you and notice if you're nodding. And I always have to remember the reason I'm here is the cross and the distance between the Jesus on the cross and the person I'm talking to. So to me, the risk of falling or being electrocuted or whatever is nothing compared to the risk of not helping people get closer to God. So on balance, it is worth it to me to take that risk. Now, I don't take unnecessary risks. In fact, not too many weeks ago, I asked the music team to move something out of the way because I knew it was a communion Sunday and I was going to be going up to the communion table. And since I can't see down here, I knew as I turned from the communion table, I'm going to trip over that. It's right on my normal walk path. <laughs> and I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to know anything about it until I, my nose hits. So we moved it. So I take reasonable precautions, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to decide to not do something. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't, I don't worry about all those kinds of hazards. I look at hazards everywhere I go, and I'm sure some of you do too. When you're out in the community, you're walking down the street, and you see some guy on the corner, and he's got, you know, he's got tattoos everywhere, and he's got lots of, lots of piercings in places you don't even want to think about, and he's got long hair, and then he's got the, you know, he's got clothes that kind of look shabby and hanging out, and his, his pants are fastened around mid-thigh, you know, and you're thinking, well, I'm sure he's just a neurosurgeon waiting to get to his next case, right? No, what did you do? You just classified him, you just profiled him, and you're probably thinking, I wonder if he's going to take my purse. I wonder if he's going to hurt me in some way. What does he want from me? Is he selling drugs or is he stealing dr money for drugs? That's a normal thing to do. You can't go by any of the qualifiers I just gave. Let me give you one example. So you look at his pants and you think, well, he might come after me and he might, he might, he might want to take, his, take money from me because, you know, that's what people that have their pants down here, that's what they do. You know how I look at that? I stand a chance to outrun that guy. Because <laughs> if you aren't fast enough to outrun somebody who's got their pants fastened around their kneecaps, you have a greater risk because of your poor health than because of them. You can look at it and say, hey, that's somebody I can give the gospel to. Or you can say, I'm worried because they look different than me. So which one is it? How do we look at those, at those risks? Do you think, oh, my job is to present the gospel to people who don't know Christ. Can I maybe present the gospel to this person? And don't automatically put them in a box and say, because this person looks like he's got tattoos everywhere and multicolored hair and multi-piercings in all sorts of places and all those things that you just checked off. You can't say, because of that, they're a bad person. That's not true. You're a bad person if you judge somebody like that. God looks at the heart. How much time did we spend getting to the heart? You see, the risks we face are one of eternity, not ones of here and now. Now, I'm not saying that if you're going in an area and you see something that makes you feel uneasy, listen to that uneasy voice, because when that voice tells you something's not right, <laughs> that little voice is right. But don't let it just be because somebody's wearing a certain something or not wearing a certain something or has more body piercings than you like or you desire or you would want your kids to have or whatever it is. None of that is really the great qualifier. And if you don't think that's true, go to Sturgis just once. Just once. And you'll find a real high concentration of CPAs and lawyers and doctors and really highly educated people that... On a normal day, you see them in a suit and tie, and you see them long sleeve shirts, and you don't know what's up underneath. So those outward markings are not the final judge. One day I'll come in in purple hair, and you just, you'll have a tough time listening to the message. Because I'll have hair. So when I think about all the risks and all the things we can and can't see, we've got to realize that 
we cannot live our lives in fear because of all the threats around us. If you live your life in fear because you think, oh, first of all, go to any high school and look at the population there. If you use the criteria I just gave you for deciding that someone's a physical threat to you, everybody in that high school just about is going to be a physical threat to you. You're going to curl up in a fetal position and die in the corner. You can't live that way. It's not okay to do that. God doesn't have a, has have a desire for us to live in that kind of fetal position. Have any of you ever traveled before? You know, when you leave the house, there's a risk, right? If you're going to go visit family, let's say in California or somewhere up, up in Illinois, when you leave the house, do you, do you analyze the risk and say, you know, I might be in a car accident. I might get a flat tire. I might, I might have a blowout. I might, I might lose a water pump. I might, I might, I might, I might. Okay, I'm going to fly. I'm just going to fly. Now, you know that's not me because I'm not going to get at 30,000 feet when I'm so allergic to, to peanuts because I can't get off the, well, I can get off the plane, but it's a tough landing. So, you know, you might decide you're going to go fly, and then you think about that, but if I fly, oh, there's the TSA. They're going to ask me all these questions. They're going to search through my stuff. I'm never going to get through the line in time. They might search me. They might pat me down. Believe me, they fear that more than you do, in my case anyway. But you still make the trip, and why do you make the trip? Because your desire to be with your family is greater than your fear of TSA, your fear of breaking down. It's a matter of equation, isn't it? Which one weighs more? So don't ever think that all the risks are just always too great because there are risks. There are risks. It's the nature of it. But our first takeaway is really this. Living life is better than fearing life. So whatever we do, and that doesn't mean we act out of, out of ignorance or out of, out of arrogance, but what it means is we need to make sure we're continuing to live life. It means we may have to do some things differently, like we're doing worship differently, we're sitting farther apart, we're wearing masks, all that kind of stuff. Those are all the accommodations we make so it is possible for us to continue to meet with a relatively safe meeting environment. It's not a perfectly safe meeting environment. There's nothing perfectly safe. It's not the way it works. But just as when I, was, when I preach and I walk across the chancel and, yeah, I run the risk of falling, I run the risk of hurting myself, but it's not that big a risk, right? And if I do, you guys will just get a laugh out of it. But the important thing is that I can keep you engaged and keep you, get you closer to Christ. That's my job. And that's my desire. So how can I say that my destination of this journey, the journey as a pastor, that that destination relationship I've got, this closer connection with Jesus for everybody in the church. How can I say that that doesn't, is not, how can I say that's more important to me than my fear over falling? Well, take a look at Psalm 23, 4b. <clears throat> I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Now, as a pastor, if I believe in the power of God, I can't very well say that God is all-powerful, but... He's not going to protect me. That doesn't mean that I'm not ever going to fall down. It doesn't mean I'm never going to trip. It doesn't mean I'm ever going to make a fool of myself. I can do that in really easily. That's not hard at all to do. But what I do know is that when I trust God more, good things happen, which is our second takeaway, and that is that more God equals less fear. The more we put our, our trust in God, the less fear we will have. Now, that doesn't mean that if you are really, really spiritual, you should start like becoming one of the great Walendas and walk the tightrope between buildings in the windstorm of Miami. That doesn't mean you do that. You still do the smart thing. You still use precautions. I don't think anybody ought to walk a cable between buildings. That's just not something that's smart to do. Maybe it's great entertainment, I don't know. But I think it's dangerous. And your family shouldn't have to live through that fear. But we can't let the fear keep us from producing, king, producing fruit for the kingdom. You know we're here to produce fruit for the kingdom, right? It's not about us, because that would be narcissism, and we're not narcissists in this church. That's a different church. So if we're supposed to produce fruit for the kingdom, how can we do that if we're afraid to go out and do anything? How can we do that if we can't, if we can't reach out? How can we do that if we're not willing to stretch out of our comfort zone and pick up the phone to call somebody because we can't see them in person? 
How can, we, how can we produce fruit for the kingdom if we never engage with that guy I described earlier that gives so many people so much concern of, of maybe they're a threat? What kind of fruit are we producing if, oh, I know, it, it's self-sustaining gardening. Produce the fruit so you can eat it. Uh, okay, you get to do a little bit of that. Certainly can enjoy that fruit but it's got to be shared with others, and that comes only when we put God in front so we have less fear. So am I in fear of COVID-19? No, I'm really not, but I do respect COVID-19. I have a tremendous respect for a virus. I know what it's capable of. I've got people I'm connected to who are dealing with it from a healthcare standpoint, people I'm connected to who have friends who have suffered through it, who have it. It's a terrible disease. It is not the flu. It is nothing like the flu. I wish that statement had never been put out there because it's, quanti- it's, it's, just, it's just, it's leagues different. And the death rate is very much different. But unfortunately, we've become a, a society where we gather little bits and tidbits of information and we live off of tidbits without looking at the holes. And the whole reality is, yes, it's a terrible virus, but we don't have to live in fear of this terrible virus. We need to accept what is true about it so we can figure out what we have to do as people to live with it, because it's not going to go away. Now, how did we do that with other great health problems we've had in the world? Well, how do we deal with polio? How do we do it with, you know, how do we do it with uh, measles and mumps and, well... We improved our health care. We learned how to, how to let our bodies do its thing. And when I say let your body do its thing, we've got to realize that God has given us a great, great amount of information and we should be using it. We should be making sure our bodies are as strong as it can be to fight off whatever it is that the insult is, whether it's COVID-19, the flu, or whatever it is. You know, the, one of the great reasons I believe anyway that the United States is having such a hard time with COVID-19 because we are one of the greatest inflammatory collections in the world. And it is an inflammatory problem in in the body that it creates. Our health, the standard American diet, impacts our health in a terrible way. And it sets our body up in a way that is very hard for you to fight off the insult of something like a COVID-19. That's why when we look and see the high numbers of of people of color who are suffering. Is there's, no, there's no magic to looking at the numbers and you say, well, why is it 30 per, that blacks and Hispanics are 30% more at risk of ha- have a bad outcome with COVID? Oh, by the way, they're also 30% more likely to have diabetes, type 2 diabetes specifically. You think it's related? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's see, they're all inflammatory and the numbers just happen to overlay. Are they factors? Probably. But what I can say absolutely is we as people have the opportunity to do everything we can to get our bodies ready to fight whatever the insult is, regardless of whether it's a flu, a cold, allergies, whatever. So we should be spending our energy on the things we know we can actually do. See, God has this this great statement in in, in verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Has anyone here ever had uh, hay fever? Anybody ever have allergy problems? Mountain cedar ever knock you upside the head? Yeah. That's the rod I'm talking about. The one that says, oh, I was supposed to start my my inhaled steroids last week. (laughs) Not today. That's the one that says, I'm supposed to stay out of the hill country when mountain cedar is so high. You see, I'm capable of, of taking what happens in my life and learning from it and putting myself in a better stance. I'm also capable of knowing that if I take some of those medications ahead of time, I don't suffer nearly as badly when the, when the pollens get really bad. It's funny, talk to your allergist about that. When should, I start, when should I start taking my medicine? Before you need it. That's the answer, before you need it. Because if you take your antihistamines before you're really exposed to all the, you know, the mold or whatever it is, your body is not going to have as much trouble. Guess what, it, guess what God tells us about his word? Study it before you know you need it. I think there's a correlation. Maybe when you feed yourself, Maybe when you put your body and your spirit in the right frame to deal with the, un, the, the realities of life, you're going to be better able to deal with it. 
So that's really what we as Christians can do right now when it comes to our overall health and COVID-19. Can we do something about it? Absolutely. We can make ourselves as healthy as we can be. So should we be exposed to the virus, we'd stand a better chance of, of fighting it off quicker and having, having fewer symptoms. And there is no downside. What is the downside of being healthier? Well, I don't know. I don't think there is really a downside to that. Which really gives us our, our, our third takeaway, and that is that we should be choosing God over fear. There is no reason for us to live in fear. We should be living for and about God. And when we do that and we, we push fear to the back, that's when our, we see this transition in our, in our lives. You see, this, the, the, the idea of the rod and the staff and they comfort me, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, there was a, a uh, we called it the, uh, the Board of Education, you know, the rod of correction within the school district. The Board of Education was in the vice principal's office right above his desk. Well, that rod that he had, that board that he used for corporal punishment was a constant reminder to us that if we didn't do what we were supposed to do, we were going to get paddled. God doesn't hit us with a paddle, but he does get our attention. Sometimes it's through health scares. Sometimes it's that health diagnosis that says you've got to deal with something very major. Sometimes it's because we fall and we hurt ourselves, and, and then you remember, oh, yeah, you're blind, buddy. You can't walk around all those trip hazards without paying attention to them. Look down every now and then. So God has a way of poking us to remind us that, that we need to do some things differently. And, you know, the, the, the shepherd's staff has is, is got a hook on one end, and that hook is so the shepherd can stand at the edge and know that, you know, that sheep right there, he's about to go over the edge. Now, I'm not going to go over there and, and run after him, because if I do, he's going to keep going right off the edge of the, uh, the cliff, right? But if I stand here calmly and grab my, with my hook, I can bring him back to safety. I can bring him back to the safety of the flock. Because the flock will not stand on the edge of that cliff. A rogue individual will. So a good shepherd brings that rogue individual back to the safety and security of the flock. That's what a pastor does. When they see someone who's wandering off, we try to reach out to them and give them every opportunity to come back to the safety and protection of the flock. And now in the pandemic times, when I'm looking at, at involvement and activities and all those, I look at it and say, okay, how do I make sure people are back within the safety of the flock without sacrificing their safety because of a pandemic. That's why we do things like online classes. That's why we're doing, taking the measures we're taking as you come in the sanctuary and asking people to wear their masks and not to sing loudly and all that kind of stuff that keeps us all safer because the worst thing we can do is allow anyone to become separated from their faith. And if I were Satan and I wanted to separate someone from their faith, I would separate them from their faith family first. Because when they lose that connection to their faith family, it's really easy to put them on the edge of the cliff and let them go over. Because the first <laughs> clap, the first thunder sound, the first growl is going to send them any way they can. They're just going to run, and they'll go fall to their death. It happens in our lives just the same. Psalm 23.5 says, You prepare a table for, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Do you really believe your cup is overflowing? I mean, when I look at Facebook posts right now and I listen to what people are saying, it's like I don't hear very many people saying how much they, they feel like their cup is overflowing because this is a good cup, okay? This is not a, a honey pot. This is a good, good cup, okay? Is it overflowing? Absolutely. It is. Thank you, Floyd. It is overflowing. You know, when, when something bad is going on in your life and you pray to God that he gets you through it, it doesn't mean that God is suddenly going to make whatever you had go wrong go away. What he's going to do is bless what you have left. If you've lost almost all of your worldly wealth, you've, you've lost it all in the stock market or whatever, somebody comes in and steals it like a thief in the night. Does that mean that God is, if you pray to God and say, God, will you please restore me? I'm just broken about this and I've worked so hard so I could do all these things. And do you think God's going to just go take the money back from the criminals and make the stock market somehow come back up to give you all the wealth that you had before? He might, but it's not very likely. What he's more likely to do is take you from where you are, your current circumstances, bless you in a way that you can then come back and do more or realize that what you had was actually an anchor that you had not even identified. When you lose your job and you realize, you know, I really want my, my job back, God, well, maybe he's got a better job for you. 
Maybe he wants you to think about what it is you are doing. Maybe your skills could be better used somewhere else. You see, when we see that God is dealing with us in a more uh, loving way, then we would ever deal with us. Because he knows long term and he knows behind the scenes and he knows the hearts involved. That's when we really do well. This, this, this phrase, you know, in the presence of my enemies, you know, you're supposed to take care of my enemies. You know, I've got all these enemies around me and all these trip hazards in life. Take care of them, would you? What would it be if I prayed that to God before the service and said, God, please take care of all these trip hazards because I don't want to fall and make a fool out of myself and blink your eye and suddenly my notes for the sermon are gone, the microphone cables are gone, the speakers are out of here, Wallace, who used to be on the bench, he's gone. What happened? Well, he did what God did what I asked. He, he made sure I wouldn't trip. But maybe he had a different way. Maybe he wanted me to focus a little more on something differently. Maybe he wanted me to acknowledge what was real around me. Maybe he wanted me to, to just settle down and not be quite so spastic on chancel. Who knows? But you see, when our focus changes, that's when life we know is getting better. Because the world will teach us to focus on the little distractions around us, the little, the little hazards. But God wants us to pay attention to something greater. Just like these little ha trip hazards here, no, my focus should be on God and your relationship with God. Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Well, because God uh, has always been and will always provide for us, it makes sense that we would say that, right? But what if we don't feel good about what's happening to us right now? What if you just lost a loved one? What if you, you just lost a lot of money? What if your health is not what it ought to be? What if you're frustrated because you can't get out and be with all your friends because of COVID or whatever else it is? Well, it's kind of hard for you to, to think all that's good. But God will always be the God of goodness. He will always be the God of mercy. So we have to change the way we're thinking about us. You know, I'm going to back up for just a minute. The valley of the shadow of death is not necessarily your current circumstances that you don't like, okay? It's easy for us to say that, oh, that's what they're talking about, all the things that you don't like. You're talking about the dangers and even, even the fact that you've got a health problem, whatever it is. But the valley of the shadow of death is not the sum of all the risks and hazards in our lives. The valley of the shadow of death is the reality that one day, because we are all sinners, if we don't accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, one day we will actually die forever to God and forever to be out of his presence. That is actually, our whole life is the valley of the shadow of death. Because if we ever lose focus, if we ever decide I'm going to worry about all these things here and not worry about the cross and not worry about Jesus as my Lord and Savior, if we ever let that happen, then what we do is we lose our focus and then our salvation, if we quit believing in Jesus, is gone. We have to believe in Jesus. We have to keep that focus there. Don't become a believer of the world. Be a believer of God. And I know some of you are saying, well, but you can't lose your salvation. Oh, look at the scripture where it says that you can't have another God before me. Start worshiping another God before God and see what happens. That's exactly what happens. We have another God before us and everything changes. But if we let the fear of these circumstances overshadow the love and the work that Jesus did for us, what a, terrible, what a terrible loss that would be for each and every one of us. But if we stay focused on Jesus, then there really is nothing to fear. That's what the scripture is telling us. And our circumstances are going to change one day. They change every day, actually. Every day our circumstances are changing. But you know what hasn't changed? Jesus. The word of God has not changed. We can trust the word of God. And he says he's going to love us through this valley. So believe that he's going to love us through this valley. It's, it's what it's going to be. Because God said it. And in verse 6, in the middle of it, it says, And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is where the title of today's message came from. From the valley to the house. Focus on the house of the Lord. 
If you focus on the trip you want to take to go see your family, then TSA doesn't bother you nearly as much. But if you focus on TSA and what those guys are going to do, then you're going to have a really miserable trip. And you know what? They may not let you go. But if you focus on your destination, in our case as Christians, focus on the house of the Lord, then we will actually get through this valley just fine. Because God will provide for us. Keep the relationships intact. See, our personal destination or our goal has got to be that we want to live in the house of the Lord forever. Now, <clears throat> when we say that, of course, we mean we want to get to heaven, right? We want to live our all eternity in heaven. But guess what? We should be bringing the house of the Lord to our address that you have your mail delivered to right now. We shouldn't be waiting until we die. So are we inviting the house of the Lord into our house are we inviting this to be the house of the Lord here at Grace Church? And how are we doing that? How open are we? How welcoming are we? Or are we saying, no, we've got to close this off because of fear? See, more urgently for each of us is how do we personally open our lives up to, to others so they know the love we have for Jesus and who Jesus is in our lives? If we set our eyes not on us and our circumstances, not on our fears, but set our eyes on Jesus, then we can bear fruit for the kingdom. Then we will hopefully one day hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So set your eyes on Jesus as our final destination. Amen? Amen. In our final song at Grace, we always invite those who have not accepted Christ before to accept Christ. You can do that at home. You can do that here. It doesn't matter where you are. If you just bear yourself to Jesus and let him know that you love him, you believe he's the son of God, and you want him in your life, in your heart, he will indeed bless you in a tremendous way. So I want to close with, with this prayer. Lord Jesus, within these walls today and within the confines of all the technology, wherever people are listening, we ask for you to bless and soften the hearts of those who are struggling right now. That they will not have fear because they know who you are. They will not worry about the circumstances they're in, but work to glorify you within those circumstances, whatever they may be. Heavenly Father, we ask for you to, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to enlighten us, <clears throat> that we might be bearers of your light. Help us, Lord, to be good ambassadors for the kingdom. And help us, Lord, to be encouraging to those who are struggling with these medical conditions from the pandemic and <clears throat> all the fear associated with that. Let us not become a slave to fear, but let us be a slave to righteousness and mercy and kindness and love and grace. This we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. As I said at the end of the message, set your eyes upon Jesus. Now we get to sing that. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe.
He did pay it all, didn't he? Let's, uh, as we leave here, I'm going to do a final blessing, but just remember that we have water out front for those who can stay and visit outside for a few minutes. It's great to be able to visit with you, so if you have the opportunity to stop and do that, we ask you to do that with us just after the service. Let's leave with this blessing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let each of us leave the blessing of God. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to bless us. Give us grace and mercy to extend to all those that we experience. This we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you guys, and we'll see you later in the week.